Hi man, peace. So as you can see here is a list of the top 10 NBA players as assessed by Bleacher Report based on a series of metrics both offensively and defensively based. Now conspicuous by their absence are both Chris Paul of the Houston Rockets and Kyrie Irving of the Boston Celtics. But once again, this is why you have to be very wary of metrics and stats, especially quote unquote advanced metrics, because many of them are predicated on what your role is on your team. When you have a Russell Westbrook, he's always going to be in the top three in any type of offensive metrics or, or PER because of the way in which he dominates the ball and the type of offense that they play in OKC. Also LeBron James, but LeBron James's exploits in his career speak for itself. We know that LeBron is the number one player in the NBA, at least most of us do. Some people may argue for Kevin Durant, but also when you look at this list, Kevin Durant is number 10. Is Kevin Durant the 10th best player in the NBA? Absolutely not. When you look at the effect that he has on the game, he is not the 10th best player in the NBA. Carl Anthony Towns is a very good young player, but do I think that he's better than Giannis Antetokounmpo or Anthony Davis or Steph Curry or Kevin Durant? No, I do not. I don't even think he's as good as Joel Embiid, to be quite frank with you. But he is a player on the come up. There's no doubt about that. But anyway, they're going to talk about it and I'm going to chime in. All right, let's take a look now at Bleacher Report's top 10 NBA players based on several metrics through the All-Star break this season. Harden, Labrizi, Westbrook, Giannis, Carl Anthony Towns, your top five. KD is 10th. Two notables not on the list were Chris Paul and Kyrie Irving, who received honorable mention. Stephen A., biggest issue with that list? My big well, before Stephen A. answers, I'm going to give you my biggest issue with the list. My biggest issue with the list is that Kyrie Irving is not on it. It's very clear that he's been the most impactful pickup of the NBA season for a team that really was not expected to be a championship contending team. Even with the addition of Gordon Hayward from the Utah Jazz, no one was really predicting the Boston Celtics to be a threat to win an NBA championship. Now, as we've gone on in the, in the season... Some of their play has started to wane. But if someone were to say that Gordon Hayward were going to go down with a catastrophic injury in game one of the NBA regular season and the Boston Celtics would still be 20 games over 500 at the All-Star break, no one would have believed you. Now, I think that Chris Paul has been the best pickup for a championship contending team. But Kyrie Irving has been the best pickup bottom line. And also give uh, honorable mention to Victor Oladipo of the Indiana Pacers. He's been phenomenal for them. My biggest issue is that CP3 was not on that list. Uh, I don't know if anybody's been paying attention, but Chris Paul is an MVP candidate. He's uh, No, he's not an MVP candidate, Stephen A. Smith. But that's more of your hyperbole trying to reconstruct a relationship with a player that at one point in time you alienated. And Stephen A. Smith does this a lot. He lets his mouth oftentimes get a little bit ahead of himself and he damages relationships and rapports with certain players in the NBA. And he tries to make up for it by over-talking them. Chris Paul is not an MVP candidate. If there was an award for the most important off-season transaction or pickup, then he'd be a candidate for that award, him and Kyrie. If he were to win that award over Kyrie, it would be understandable to me. But I think that Kyrie has been the most important off-season pickup in the NBA. They're, they're, the Boston Celtics are probably going to win about 56 games this year, which is only going to be maybe four or five more games than they won last year. But to me, it's been discernible how much improved their team has been, especially without Gordon Hayward. Now, Damian Lillard is a great player, but he's not as good as Kyrie or CP3. Sorry. He's not the MVP candidate that James Harden is. James Harden of the Houston Rockets is the leading candidate for league MVP right now. Well, you know, when I think of candidate, when I think of that term candidate, I, I envision that word encapsulating something that is a viable option. Chris Paul is not a viable option right now for the MVP, meaning realistic. The only realistic MVP candidate for this regular season is James Harden. So to me, that conversation is null and void, Stephen A. And if the vote were today, James Harden would be the league MVP. Chris Paul's in that conversation, though. Has anybody seen what they have done with him on the basketball floor? Has anybody seen how him and James Harden have flowed? Has anybody noticed that they haven't even lost more than four games together while they've been on the court? 
Yes, they've been very impressive. Shockingly impressive, to be quite honest with you. I did not think that they were going to vibe that well. I certainly was wrong about that. Chris Paul looks like a superstar. And oh, by... He looked like a superstar for the last 12 years, Stephen. And where you been, bro? By the way, in case you haven't noticed, look at the Clippers without him. Okay? Because even though... They well, actually, the Clippers have been very competitive without him. I don't, I don't think that that is a good contrast. It's not like he left the Clippers and they turned into the Dallas Mavericks or the Orlando Magic. They're still very competitive and vying for a playoff spot. So I don't really think that you have to prove Chris Paul's greatness by pointing at the L.A. Clippers. I think that the Clippers have done very well for themselves. That Doc Rivers and Jerry West and those boys are still grinding and there's still an outside shot that they'll be in the playoffs. The bottom line is they are a completely different team and far less effective without Chris Paul. Uh, no. Actually, I think that trying to rehash any old memories of Chris Paul with the Clippers is actually a, you know, is actually a detraction on Chris Paul because that team was underwhelming with him, to be quite frank with you. They never once even got out of the second round, Stephen A. So if I were Chris Paul, I would not even want you to bring up my tenure with the L.A. Clippers. Than they were with him. And when I look at the way that he has been performing, it's not just about numbers, it's about leadership, and it's about giving you the impression that big things are going to happen just because you have arrived. I agree with that. I totally agree with that. I think that with his arrival in Houston, he certainly made them a viable candidate for a championship. Once again, that's what I think when I think the term candidate, I think something that's viable, realistic. That is what Chris Paul has done in Houston, and I don't see how he could have been left off that list. Oh, I do. How many games has he missed this year? Ding. <laughs> yes, I would like to know how they compiled their metrics for Kyrie Irving to not be on that list and for Damian Lillard to be on the list. But you know what? When you truly evaluate it, when you assess it, the Boston Celtics offense is a lot less me-oriented than the Portland Trailblazers offense. But once again, I would like to know exactly how they compiled it, what metrics they used. Um, many times, even when they're, they're assessing the PER, player efficiency rating, you'll see that most of the players who have the higher usage rates are the ones who have the higher player efficiency ratings. So you have to balance that out with what you see on the floor and the type of offense that a team runs as well as the type of defense that a team runs to truly be able to discern who has the most impact for their team. But just looking at this list and having Kevin Durant at number 10 tells you that something is a little bit off and skewed in how they decided that they were going to, to evaluate these players. A whole lot. 12 to 15. I, I think it's... I'll double check. I'll double check. It, it's a big number. He's, yep. He's played, he's played in 39 games. Okay. He's missed a lot of games. And that's all that is. The reason he's not on the list is because this is not subjective. It's based on different analytics that they run everyone through for total value. And Chris Paul, game for game. By the way, you say he plays like a superstar. You know why? Because he is a superstar. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, what is that in Stephen A. Smith's coffee cup there? Is that really coffee or is that something else? Because for him to say he's playing like a superstar, dude, he's been in the league for like 12 years now. Where, where have you been? Chris Paul's one of the best players in the game. One of the best players ever. So sure, game for game, he's an MVP candidate. But if you miss a bunch of games, he's and other eight. guys... He's uh, missed 18. 18 games. You miss 18 games and you're playing in 39. It's a huge percentage of the season. You can't be an MVP. I mean, you know, like, uh, you'd have to be twice as good as everyone else, which he's not. He's just about as good as anyone else. That's why he's not top 10. By the way, what, what I feel find really interesting about the list is Carl Anthony Towns cracked the top five. Thank you, sir. That was very strange for me, especially seeing as Carl Anthony Towns is not viewed as a big man who's dominant on the defensive side of the basketball. So I'm not quite sure exactly what analytics or what type of, of metrics algorithm they're running over at Bleacher Report. I'd be interested in knowing that. I'm sure one of you brothers can inform me or correct me, or if I have time, I'll check it out on my own. But for Carl Anthony Towns to be ranked top five uh, in all NBA players, nah, I, I just don't see that. The brother's having a great season. He has learned how to find his niche in their team, especially with the introduction of Jimmy Butler. But no, I don't see that. And if you recall, coming out of college, everyone knows, like, wow, 
Carl Anthony Towns is going to be amazing and everything. His defense lagged behind until recently, you know, because he looked like he was going to be a really good NBA defender, and he is turning into one. And when you combine that with his offense, Carl Anthony Towns, who is the guy you would want, including Chris Stapps, Porzingis, and everyone, that was the guy based on injury history, based on level of play, the whole thing that you would want out of that draft, and it is turning out that way. You know, we talk a lot about Embiid and until recently Porzingis, uh, of course, and, and Anthony Davis and everything, but there's Carl Anthony Towns pops up in the top five already, and you know what? He deserves it. Uh, no, he doesn't deserve it. He's a great player, but he's not as good as Embiid, and he's not as good as Anthony Davis. Um, once again, I think that sometimes numbers and statistics can make you tell a certain narrative that you want to convey. I'm not saying that Bleacher Report necessarily has an agenda. I'm just saying that their, their, their compilation of statistics may not be as proficient as it needs to be. Because any compilation that has Kevin Durant at number 10 is not as proficient as it needs to be. And it's, no, and it's in no way to poo-poo Carl Anthony Towns. He's a very good, borderline, great young player, and he's certainly on the come up. But he's not number five. If anything, I could see them switching him and Kevin Durant and then swapping out KD and Westbrook. Because West, uh, KD right now, as far as impact, is the third best player in the NBA after Harden and, and uh, LeBron James. And then probably four, I would put... I'll probably keep Antetokounmpo at four. And then put Anthony Davis at five. And then Curry at six. Move Butler down to seven. Lillard wouldn't even be in there. And I would have to have I would have to put Kyrie probably at number eight. What about or did you want to comment on that? No, no, no. I ask no, you no. about Kate. Carl, uh, listen, I can't rule out anything about Carl Anthony Towns because he's special and he's still developing. Um, I like what I see. Uh, once upon a time, I thought Jaleel Okafor because I'm looking at a back to the basket player that could average 20 and 10, even though he got, uh, I think that he was misused and mistreated in Philadelphia. Yes, he was. He was a casualty of the trust the process process. <laughs> Yeah. The bottom line is he is no Carl Anthony Towns. Carl Anthony Towns is special, and he deserves our credit. I just don't know about the top five as of yet. No, he's not there. What about Durant at 10? Thank you, Molly. At least you're paying attention. That's that makes no, no, that makes no sense to me. That makes no Listen, sense. there's one basketball and a bunch of guys sharing it, and basketball is the most dynamic of all the American team sports. Uh -huh. And so to isolate value is sometimes very difficult. It really depends. You know, the value to the team has to do with the system you're in, how well you fit it. What agreed, agreed, agreed. But that's the difference between a computer compilation and flesh and blood evaluation, Max Kellerman. You're supposed to trump that. You cannot give over your understanding, your comprehension to artificial intelligence. That's not wise and that's not prudent. What your usage rate is, etc., and not always actually intrinsically how good you are. In other words, James Harden comes out number one here. If Mike D'Antoni had LeBron James in that system, do I believe LeBron James would be number one according to these numbers? Yeah, by a lot. So it's not really gauging the intrinsic value of every player. It's, it's trying to gauge, what they're trying to do here is gauge actually the contributions on the court of yeah. each player. I agree with that, but I don't understand how Kevin Durant still can come out number 10 seeing as he's averaging over 25 a game and he's one of the top defenders in the National Basketball Association. So where is this coming from? I would just like to know what their parameters are. That's all. The list is not terrible. It's just not complete. Kyrie Irving should be in there over Damian Lillard. But once again, as I've already touched on and as Max Kellerman has alluded to, the system that Portland runs is much more guard-centric than in Boston. Kyrie Irving moves the ball a lot, particularly in the first three quarters. And if the game is close, then he'll try to take over in the fourth quarter. And that's dependent upon things more than just Like himself. the talent they're with. Kyrie right. Irving, though, that doesn't surprise you? Well, listen, that way... Thank you, Molly. Molly's on point here. That way I look at it, that, that, listen, uh, here's my whole point. Kyrie Irving should have been in the conversation considering the MVP caliber year he was having just until a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Kevin Durant is one of the top two players in the game. I think it's sacrilegious and blasphemous. Hey, somebody's got him at rank 10 on any list when it comes to the sport of basketball. How the hell can you be number two in the world? Or arguably yeah, number, yeah. number two or three in the world, but you're number 10 on this list. 
Give me a break. That makes no sense whatsoever at all. And so I look at it from that perspective. Of course, I got other issues with the list. But I, I'm saying that Chris Paul is an MVP candidate. He game really, for game, Steven. Really, well, listen, game for listen, game. Listen, listen, I'm, 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 He's just talking. Stephen A is just talking. Him and Chris Paul had a falling out about three, four years ago. So now he goes overboard trying to lavish him with praise. He does the same thing with James Harden, who he fell out with after he got on TV and castigated him for his performance in the 2012 NBA Finals when the Oklahoma City Thunder lost to the Heat. That's what Stephen A does. That's also why, as I tell you guys, why he comes on first take and he throws shots at LeBron James. He's angry at LeBron for not giving him any one-on-one -on -one interviews. Again, I'm not arguing the 18 games. I understand. But to me, that's the only argument that can be made against him. Of course. And I bet when he's on the court, he's had more of an impact than some of those people on that list. And that's the way I was looking at it. I, I was guarantee about the 18 you. Games missed. I get right, but then how do you gauge Steph Curry's contribution? When you have a Steph Curry on the floor, that totally stretches out your defense because you have to have a man on him out to 30 feet. That opens up offensive opportunities for players like Zaja Pachulia because the paint is so open. You have, two, you have two guys watching Steph, one guy guarding him, and he's standing out beyond a three-point line. Is there a metric to evaluate that? Are you able to create an algorithm that can factor that in when you're making a list like this? It's not always what a player is doing when he has the ball or when he's playing defense. Sometimes just his presence can have an unbelievable impact on the game. I have no problem with Harden at number one because this is a regular season evaluation and he's a great regular season player. But if you're going to ask me if I believe that James Harden is a top five NBA player, no, I do not. No, I do not. Neither is Carl Anthony Towns. Neither is Damian Lillard a top ten player. No, he's not. But, you know, it is what it is. It's good fodder for debate and conversation. I guarantee you if they broke this down on a per game basis, Chris Paul would be in this top 10. According to these metrics, I bet you he'd be in the top five. I mean it's possible. In regards to impact, he should be in the top five for what he's been able to do with the team. But, sh but so should Kyrie. Kyrie's certainly top 10 in regards to what he's done for the Boston Celtics this season. I mean, Chris Paul's having an outstanding year, partly because they can use him as a guy who can cut to the basket and stuff. Like, he can actually be a scorer. Chris and beyond that, he can play off the ball almost as well as he plays with the basketball. Chris Paul's a great, a great scorer and just can't always be used that way. But with Harden, when Harden's on ball, Chris Paul can be used that way. So there's no doubt that game for game, he's in the top 10. Just missed 18 games, brother, by the way. What this list shows, and especially the names that are, are not on this list, has there ever been a time in NBA history where there's been this much talent in the league? Let me say this. I've mentioned this before. The NBA is in a great spot right now. They're in a great situation. They have a, a multitude of talent in the NBA. Now, there was a stretch what ended, I would say, maybe about five years ago, where there was a dearth of great big men in the league which kind of allowed Tim Duncan to hang on a little longer than he most likely should have been able to hang on. But now with Embiid and Carl Anthony Towns and Boogie Cousins and Anthony Davis, you know, coming to fruition in regards to their understanding of the game and what was prognosticated for them to be able to achieve on an NBA court, the NBA right now is as good as it's ever been talent-wise. And in regards to skill set, as I've already stated, the face-up game in the NBA is better than it's ever been. With players' ability to break down their mat off the dribble facing up. Now we know the fact that they cannot hard hand check like they, like they did at one time back in the 90s. That does make it much easier. And the fact that you have stretch fours and fives. Once you beat your man, you're pretty much at the bucket. Sure, but that's, that's more of an after effect of the improved shooting in the league than anything else. What the NBA is lacking that it had back in the... 80s and 90s was you know just just the nuance the the diversity of offensive uh, offensive tactics it wasn't just about taking threes and and making layups like it is today you have players who are mid-range specialists post-up specialists that's what the NBA is missing right now and hopefully that will come back once that comes back the NBA is going to be better than it's ever been because you have certain players playing right now that are in the conversation or will be in the conversation for the greatest players ever at their position. Already right now, Russell Westbrook is the most athletic point guard to ever play in the NBA. Kyrie Irving, by the time his career is done, 
will be in the conversation for, for greatest little man to ever play in the NBA. He'll be in the conversation. He's got three finals appearances. He's got one finals victory in which he was not just a member. He was an integral part of that. Kevin Durant and LeBron James are going to be in the conversation for the greatest forwards in NBA history, the greatest three men in NBA history. They're going to be right there, if not above Larry Bird, when they're all, when they're all done. I'm already on record as stating that I have LeBron about a half step behind Larry only because of what I know about uh, certain PEDs that he allegedly used and also due to the fact that he's had a lot of flame outs in big spots. But if he gets a fourth championship, I'm going to have to put him above Bird. And if KD is able to get you know, two or three more championships, I would most likely have to put him in that area of top 15. And it'll be a conversation where would you take him or take Larry Bird? I know a lot of people say, oh, how could you say that's a conversation? KD is better here, 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 and here. Look, man, Larry Bird was an alpha. KD will never be an alpha. He has more talent than Larry. He has more speed than Larry. He will never be an alpha. Mentally, he's nowhere near on Larry Bird's level. But just because of the, the, the difference, the disparity in talent, it'll be a conversation at the end of KD's career if he's better than Larry Bird. All right, so and who knows where Embiid and Antetokounmpo are going to go with their careers? So the NBA is in a great spot, and of course you have the greatest pure shooter of all time, Steph Curry. This is absurd. It's absurd, and I got a final take coming for you guys pretty soon on the big man. You know how everyone says, "Oh, the big man." What happened to the yeah. big man? We are in by far the golden era of the big man, and no one seems to know it. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but I think that. This current crop of big men are very underrated. You can certainly compare Carl Anthony Towns and Bede, Boogie Cousins, Anthony Davis, and also throwing very, very skilled players like, like Nurkic and Jokic. You could throw them in to that late 80s, early 90s era of the NBA where you had Hakeem and, and uh, Patrick Ewing, uh, David Robinson. Then you had lower level players like Brad Daugherty and, and uh, uh, what's this guy's name? De uh, I, was, I was almost about to say Detlef Shrimp. Detlef Shrimp was a nice little swing player, but that's not who I'm thinking of. The player who was on the Pacers, the center. Oh, Rick Smith. Rick Smith was playing today. He'd be very effective. He had a good little mid-range game. Rick Smith was very reminiscent of, what's this guy's name who plays with the Lakers? Uh, you know, one of the twins. Uh, I don't know why this guy's name is skipping my mind right now. Oh, Lopez. Lopez. Lopez with the Lakers. Rick Smith had a, had a game very, very similar to his. Except, of course, in the modern NBA, Lopez could stretch the, can stretch the floor a little bit more than Rick Smith could. But Rick Smith had range out to 20 feet. Lopez likes to take a lot of threes. He doesn't make any, but he likes to take them. But yeah, this is a very good big man era in the NBA. I wouldn't quite put it in that late 80s, early 90s demographic because I think that you have more dominant big men back then. I don't think that anybody playing today is as good as Shaq or Hakeem Olajuwon was. But they, they have the potential. Looking forward to it. We got more to get you guys on the... But anyway, that's it on the list. I disagree with most of it. But, you know, of course, since it's based on an algorithm, on a mathematical formula, they'll act like it's something official. But anyway, peace.